thank you very much. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit um, now just about the kind of integration of the session. But first, I'm going to introduce our two um, other panelists. So um, I'm delighted to say we've got with us today um, Harriet Kingaby. Um, uh, Harriet's a Mozilla Fellow um, who has been embedded with Consumers International um, over the last year, working on um, a project studying the unintended consequences of AI powered advertising. Um, forthcoming report, I believe, this month. Is that right? Uh, yes, end of this month. Yeah, looking forward to that a lot. Um, before Mozilla, um, Harriet worked in brand strategy um, across a range of different agencies. So she has a lot of experience in the practice of advertising and marketing, uh, as well as in the kind of study of it, which I think is really interesting. Um, and she's also the co-chair of the Conscious Advertising Network, um, which I'll, I'll ask you to explain a little bit more about um, when we come to you. So I think that in itself is, is another thing worth thinking about. Um, so we've also got with us Carl Miller. Um, Carl is the research director at the Centre for the Analysis of Social Media um, at Demos. Um, and from his bio, I'd say he's interested in how social media is changing society and how researching it can inform important decisions. And there's a list of things that that includes, which I'll read some of out, because to be fair, that does include a lot of things. So we have, this includes digital politics and digital democracy, cyber crime and the hacking community, information warfare and online disinformation and fake news, digital and citizen, citizen journalism and, and others. Um, and he researches and writes widely on these issues, including for Wired, New Scientist, the Sunday Times, The Telegraph and The Guardian. He's a visiting research fellow at King's College London. Uh, and his first book was published in 2018 by Penguin Random House. It's called The Death of the Gods, The New Global Power Grab, which is an examination of new centres of power and control in the 20, uh, 21st century. Um, and I would highly recommend if you've not come across um, Carl's writing before, do look it up. It's really interesting stuff there. Um, so thank you both for coming. Um, so just I'll just talk a little bit briefly about the kind of inspiration behind the session and then I'll, I'll spend as much time as possible hearing from you too um, on your areas of expertise. So um, as, as you might expect, the inspiration from this panel really came from um, the post-election moment in 2019, I suppose what became early 2020, um, you know, and particularly it felt a bit like a sort of fool me once moment where, you know, Whereas there'd been up until 2016, this big wave of enthusiasm, and it's hard to believe now, but pre-2016, people thought, on the whole, I think that social media was a broadly progressive and positive force, and we could be optimistic about where it was going. Obviously, Cambridge Analytica and the 2016 election, suddenly there was this moment when, um, you know, that was really cast into huge doubt and people started um, assuming the worst of social media and, and its consequences. Um, and yet for all the kind of furore in the, the following three years, um, post 2019 election, there seemed to be a lot of confusion and shock that, that the kind of apparent positive success that there'd been on, on social media um, in campaigning at the election hadn't translated into um, electoral success. And that the energy that had gone into sort of getting huge engagement stats and, and apparent success um, on those platforms hadn't kind of created this political coalition that was kind of united and um, behind trying to make the world better. Um, and that was quite confusing, I think, in the sense that when um, there's a lot of analysis of media on the left, there's a lot of kind of looking at the structures and incentives of mainstream media and, and, and what goes on behind them and, and showing how that turns out bad outcomes and talking about kind of media influence and yet it felt like there was a little bit less of a um, less of a desire to kind of follow through on the analysis of social media and, and say well what actually is this is this platform are these platforms and the way that they're built actually ever going to produce the kind of outcomes that we want because something about the the fundamental structure seems to be wrong so yeah, so we thought it was good be good to kind of dig into that a bit more. There's obviously a lot of different um, different angles to come at it from. I think um, as the list um, of subjects that the Centre for Analysis of Social Media has uh, has covered and that Carl's covered in his in his writing would suggest, you know, it's it, it's it, there's so many different uh, problems that have been raised over the years um, 
that that social media you know doesn't create but contributes to uh, or has been has been accused of contributing to um and you know these overlap and many of them get confused for each other um, and some of them are very contested but i think um it is nevertheless difficult to sometimes to feel like you're covering everything so many of them um exist so so carl i thought we'd start with you just to kind of um given your overview of the subject uh, from the centre, to just give us a kind of your, some of your thoughts on the, the, the current state of play, sort of where we are at the moment in thinking about social media um, and politics in some ways and sort of what the, um, what the latest thinking is around that. Um, where, is the, where are the, the, the areas of most concern, um, where, where the research, I suppose, is strongest in showing problems and um, uh, we'll move on a little bit later, maybe to talking about solutions. But to start with, where you, where you, where the kind of um, the biggest issues are as you see it. Hey there, everyone. Yeah, I think um, you're still muted. I, there you go. Am I? Yeah. I think the last time we were reasonably positive about the potential impacts of social media on politics around the world was probably 2011. I remember kind of writing kind of breathless articles in the midst of the, the, the internet was going to render despotisms and autocracies impossible, outmoded, you know, obsolete. And really since then, over the last kind of decade, it's been really just a gruelling, punishing, slow, sometimes fast retreat from that position. Um, We've kind of dealt with social problem after social problem, one after the other across those 10 years. Um, first, it was a fear of the kind of terrorist exploitation of the internet. Then, then it was around the way it was um, amplifying and mobilizing hate and intolerance and dissent. You know, then it was about the kind of role of dark money. Then it was about the collapse of journalism. Then it was about the growth of monopoly and the overweening power of economic um, uh, and probably the thing that we've been on the front lines of more than anything else over over the last well since really since the lockdown um, has been the uh, well two things the absolute furious kind of onslaught of information warfare and influence operations online um, and secondarily I think we're living through the single most conspiracy theoretical moment in any of our lifetimes um, we've never seen anything like this before. We've never seen anything like what is currently happening, this kind of churning subcultural morass that's been developing more and more and more, um, largely as people have been able to leave their bedrooms over the, over the lockdown. And now we're seeing that kind of rolling onto the streets in ways that lots and lots of other movements and mobilizations have done before. Um, my, my, to, 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 to answer your question directly, Daniel, though, um, my kind of view for a very long time has been that I, I actually don't think that social media particularly benefits any particular political movement. I think it basically is demolishing political parties in important ways. I think the monopolies that political parties have had over mobilization and mass communication have come tumbling down. You see the world is kind of mobilization and counter mobilization across the whole of the political spectrum. Um, so suddenly the things that used to, used to be really expensive and difficult have become free and easy. And that means that every, everyone is benefiting from it. It's benefiting, you know, um, pro-democracy campaigns in Romania and it's be benefiting fascists in Russia. It's benefiting conspiracy theorists and it's benefiting people that are agitating for female reproductive rights. Um, all over the world, really, outside of that mainstream that, that looked and felt so narrow not that long ago, um, we've suddenly seen brush fires of, of, of all these other kinds of politics becoming kind of newly powerful, newly visible, um, and, and kind of, you know, um, suddenly ripping apart whatever consensus we thought existed in politics. And, and that's really what's happening. Um, I, I, I just think that it's too tangled and complex and massive and kind of breathtakingly difficult to understand the space for us to just directly say that it's either the left or the right or this group or that group that really benefit. Um, really, like the only people that I don't think really have 
benefited have been have been the mainstream itself. Um, I think it's felt to the mainstream and to liberal democratic institutions like they've been under attack from themselves. Uh, and I think that's that's largely that's largely right. Thank you. It's uh, very interesting. I think it, would you say then though that it does well. I mean, I think you're of course right that there hasn't been a, a kind of a clear um, benefit to one very obvious political side at the expense of the other. But is it fair to say that the the social media has favoured a particular style of politics, at least in the sense that you know, and, and that might be that that style of politics is in different circumstances comes results in different um, outcomes and, and supports different political. Uh, ideologies, but that there is a particular type of politics down to the kind of behaviour and um, incentives that are in place on social media. Um, I mean, you, we, we, it's been labelled populism, I suppose. People have called it. Obviously, that looks very different in different places. But um, you know, it's been pointed out by a few people that we we haven't seen a great deal of success in terms of left populist movements on the basis of social media actually translating into electoral success yet whereas you know many we've seen left kind of um protest movements be successful on, on social media but as yet not yet uh, an example particularly of a kind of left social media populist translating into electoral yeah i mean i, I confess that I, i've never quite understood what populism actually really means um I, I've, I've often felt it's often a label uh, at, at one's opposition and, and has certainly been thrown by all different parties to all other different parties over the last year or so. But um, to, to, to not focus on the content for a minute, but to focus as on the beginning part of your question, which is how social media platforms work, I think that's a good place maybe for us to kind of begin all of this because um, it focuses on a part of the online environment that we speak far too little about, which is the actual plumbing, the actual like, engineering of these forms we never we, we very rarely focus on that and that is vastly more important i think than almost anything else um all almost all commercial social media platforms and i'm sure harriet is going to much more eloquently take us through much of this uh, they're, but they're they're all kind of optimized for engagement that's a very very important thing to understand about them they're all locked in this furious battle one another for daily active users monthly active users eyeballs on their platforms and that means that they all have accurately optimized to try and keep you on their platforms. Um, I interviewed, in fact, uh, a gentleman called DJ Fogg, who used to run the place at Stanford, and it's much of his like work, which actually underlie how these platforms work. It's this kind of joining together of kind of tech design and psychology. Um, but, but in there kind of for your attention, uh, it's true that they definitely do privilege some kinds of information over others. And I think I think it probably is fair to generalize that the kinds of information that they tend to privilege is information which elicits an immediate and strong primordial even psychological reaction from us. Um, and if you're a viral advertiser, you know that extremely well. Uh, and that might be quite a good definition of populism you've come up with there, I think. potentially. <laughs> Maybe, but, but, but perhaps so. But, but, but then it is it is a definition which I think is being leveraged, like again, a, a different ways. Um, but yeah, I mean, and maybe that's a good place to begin because 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 certainly it looks like the kind of tenor of much political debate um, or successful political messaging is that which manages to make us either very angry or very happy to laugh or cry or scream uh, almost immediately after seeing the content. Uh, and and I, I think that has creating a kind of raw, um, less nuanced, of course, less subtle kind of way of talking about politics um, over the last, say, four or five years for sure. Thank you. And Harriet, so so coming to you, just to follow on from that, um, you know, where does the where does advertising play a role in this? Because you know, obviously, those platforms were set up. The main platforms that we know are almost universally built on models where ad selling advertising in various different ways is is how that they make money. Uh, as Mark Zuckerberg's famous response to the U.S. senator um, is always recalled as the example of. Could you just tell us a little bit more about that and your experience of um, from both sides of working as a kind of marketer advertiser using using Facebook and then on tell us a bit more about the conscious advertising network and some of your work um, from that side. Sure. So um, just to kick off with the thing that I can reel off my time quite quickly um, the conscious advertising network and um, which um, I co-chair with, um, with, with a gentleman called Jake Dubbins 
is a voluntary coalition of over 90 organizations who are looking at ensuring the ethics catches up with the technology of modern advertising. So it's our we we've got our members are everyone from kind of O2 right and in the body shop right through to um, kind of agencies and tech providers like Accenture Interac Interactive and loads of ad tech companies hasn't heard of. Um, but we also and we also bring civil society to the table because um, people like um, kind of show racism, the red card, um, you know, kind of friends, families and travellers, etc. Because what we were finding was that conversations about uh, kind of ethics in e ethics and the impacts that adver digital advertising can have on affected communities were either happening within the affected communities or they were happening within advertiser you know kind of you know advertisers speaking to advertisers and of course both you know both sets of organizations were defining the problems and the solutions very very differently so part of our role is to bring those those organizations together and try and find solutions that actually are holistic so address address issues for both sides um so there's a lot to start with there there's so much to go on i think i'm going to kick off with um what i'm going to kick off with what advertising has done to information um, because I think that's a really important thing to understand. Um, what well, advertising on social media has done, and social media has done to information. So um, we have a, a, a kind of phenomenon. There was years ago when I first started working in social media. There was we talked about a phenomenon called snackability, um, which is a hideous phrase. But basically, what it was starting to mean was that our ability to absorb large amounts of information was waning, and actually, your average person was uh, kind of starting to understand and process information in much smaller bits. So, you know, your tweet of however many characters or your 10 second video, because most people, you've got to grab people's attention in the first three seconds of a video, otherwise most people drop off, for example. Um, and we see that trend continuing. And I see, I think, you know, what you were alluding to, Dan, was the idea that simple messages and mantras or simple um, kind of short video clips actually fly very, very well on these platforms. And I think that is, is very much the case. So it does make it a lot easier. It does make um, kind of your your politicians um, who can kind of communicate very succinctly or create mantras or slogans or whatever. It definitely those kind of things definitely do fly on social media. The next thing that advertising um, kind of has done to information um, is it has also changed the way that we report because if you are going to sit down with your copy of I don't know whatever newspaper floats your boat on a on a pub on a Sunday on, on a Sunday afternoon and spend some time with it that is a completely different reading experience to being on your commute and flicking through loads of headlines um, flicking through your Facebook feed for example and working out what to click on so that process has also mean that we start we've started to see a kind of journalism that looks as well yeah yeah absolutely it's like journalism that looks that um kind of you know that, that, that essentially is optimized for kind of um you know kind of people to click through so you're starting to see headlines that look more like advertising journalism that feels a bit more like kind of clickbait success metrics in journalism more more around actually engage, engagement so that's the first thing and Johnny, you're absolutely right. It's also about structure. So you've then got these enormous, you've got these very large kind of tech platforms who have um, IPO, so they, you know, they, they need they need to make money for their investors. Um, and how do they make money? Well, you make money by serving more ads, Senator. Um, working out places that you can serve more ads, working out how to optimize those ads and make them more effective. Um, and you've got metrics that are set for kind of doing that. So that also kind of changes the way that the, the, the information is kind of is, is structured on platforms. Um, and it's turned these, um, these these channels very much into kind of paid paid advertising channels. Like it used to be that if you were a grassroots organization, you could put out a load of tweets or a load of kind of Facebook posts and your members would see them. Now it's all optimized for kind of cash. Um, so that also, um, you know, kind of changes, cha you know, changes that information environment. You're not, when you're on social media, you're no longer in a in a kind of a, a public space for sharing things with your friends. Arguably, you are in a commercial environment, and that commercial environment, um, you know, is going to dictate the information that's on it. Um, thirdly, um, what what advertising has done and social media has amplified is um, the ability for uh, kind of far right actors and misinformation actors to actually have a business model. So. 
if I am, the most famous example of this is Pizzagate, where Macedonian teenagers were creating fake news websites um, that suggested that Hillary Clinton, Bill Gates and whoever else you want to talk about um, was kind of running a, a paedophile ring out of a, a pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C. And they were keeping children down there. Um, and actually, that, that was the culmination of a lot of fake news being generated by Macedonian teenagers who were then um, who had worked out that the, the more salacious the content they created, um, the more likely it was to get served on social uh, kind of uh, kind of uh, engaged with on social media, um, and therefore the more re revenue they were going to generate because people would be interacting with their site. So you've also got that kind of structural kind of it's created a business model for fake news and misinformation, and also for hate speech as well. We're seeing examples of where kind of far right publications and um, organizations are able to monetize, uh, you know, kind of monetize stuff on wherever. Now, this salacious information that we talked about um, works uh, and the engagement that we talked about also works really well through recommendation algorithms. So if I'm searching, if I'm looking, if, if I'm on YouTube and I'm looking for, I don't know, you know, kind of what, you know, kind of like, what, what's the EU's policy on migration, you know, X then, you know, kind of actually the videos that are going to be less interactive with might be kind of straightforward videos where someone explains policy positions of different of different countries, for example. But what will absolutely shoot through the rankings is, uh, you know, kind of the rebel media, what they won't tell you about um, the EU, you know, kind of the EU kind of policies on migration or, um, you know, kind of or some or, or someone who's created content that's so de you know, kind of divisive that it's getting lots of engagement comments, you know, kind of whatever. So that's also an issue. So again, so we've got this kind of content, we've got the content, whether it's changed content, we've got the structure of the organization and the, and the information environment you're in itself. Um, and then you've also got how bad actors play into that. So that was a big, long and rambly, but that's some of the stuff that we look at at the Conscious Advertising Network. And we look at how we can help advertisers avoid monetizing, uh, you know, kind of hate speech and misinformation, we look at, you know, we talk to the platforms about what they can do to change that information environment and ensure that it's a safe place <coughs> for advertisers to advertise, but also are, you know, kind of like the, the bulk of people to be interacting with. Um, and uh, yeah, and, you know, kind of like we look at everything from misinformation to children's welfare to, uh, you know, kind of uh, issues around hate speech, etc. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been amazing watching the, the growth of the um, Conscious Advertising Network over the last couple of years, particularly, I think, has it been? Or uh, it, how long has it been now that Pan's been around? I mean, we've been ba banging on about this since about uh, 17, but we officially, um, you know, we, we've officially been around for about two and a half years. Yeah, and it's just been it's been it's been incredible to see the number of, of really large um, organisations and advertisers and, and marketing agencies and so on that signed up for this. That there is actually you know even within the industry that is most in a way implicated with the advertising economy that there's a clear um, dissatisfaction with the way that, that this structure works. So it's not even working for them. You know, it's only really working for the large technology companies who have in an incredibly short amount of time cornered the entire you know a huge proportion of the marketing of the advertising. Um, budget and then you know taking that away from lots of other things that were being funded that way but um, yeah and, and certainly they don't make it easy for those organizations that do want to make it do something about it though you talked about the kind of um, trying to do safety lists but then there's also the difficulty of, of when um, advertisers try not to fund these extreme content sometimes funding gets taken away from other things like coverage of, of smaller so it's made very difficult because the platforms aren't taking responsibility for this they're putting it back on sort of saying well you know you tell us what you don't want to advertise on um, and that's caused a lot of problems as well absolutely yeah i mean i think I found that um 73 of lgbtq content was unable to be monetized through advertising under the current system advertisers create things called block lists um which sound really sensible you know if you're an air, if you're an air uh, airline company you definitely don't want to appear on a um, article with the word crash in it um you know for example but you know if you if you've got words like muslim lesbian on your block list then you're just instantly demonetizing loads and loads and loads of diverse content so there is also that issue whereby 
um, you know, kind of, and we, we saw it over around kind of the, the Black Lives Matter protest in the States. We've seen it around um, COVID information whereby organizations will block hard news as well. So that means that it becomes, you know, difficult for, uh, for papers to kind of justify covering hard news if they can't get the advertising revenue for it, which isn't a, you know, isn't a situation that anyone would want to be in. Um, so it's a very imperfect system. And um, <clears throat> a lot of what we're trying to do is to raise awareness and get advertisers to really think about where um, themselves as, as uh, kind of their media spend, essentially, is, is kind of funding the internet that they want to see. Because, you know, advertising revenue underpins the funding, the funding model of, of much of the internet as we see it and of these platforms. Yes, I think it's it's, um, and it's and it's I think it's interesting that to me at least it seems um, underappreciated the importance of advertising in in our kind of in economy and society and culture as a whole. You know that it seems that because for a lot of us we we want to kind of just ignore it. It's something that we kind of put up with that's there in the background. What people don't appreciate is the way advertising funds things is actually structuring as you say our, our entire information environment what we see every day how we think of ourselves you know how we do our politics and so on and but because we don't we have a desire to kind of not think about it not see it as something important we don't seem to see that as something that's worth um addressing on a political level or as a, a kind of an emergency in any sense um carl to come to you again i i, I wanted to just um come back to um something you were talking about um before in terms of the different um the different results of this um stuff of this system and how it works at the moment um obviously the different platforms have very different um ways of working but there are some very similar underlying structures there and um we talked about politics and and it favoring a particular style of politics, but also the kind of breakdown of a, a kind of breakdown of a common reality there that, that I think you, you were talking about in terms of you know information warfare and and, and conspiracy theory, much of which is it's fairly incoherent, but seems to be sort of fermenting this 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 general sense of people not knowing what is going on or believing in in, in fairly ludicrous. Um, theories about the world. I mean, do you talk a bit more about the kind of the processes and, and where you see that going in the future? Is there any kind of, are there any efforts being made to kind of counter this trend? Or it feels very difficult at the moment to to, to see, um, you know, the, the kind of broad based popular movement that, that people imagine they would like, you know, we'd like to see in our, in our politics towards building something better. It feels hard to imagine at this point with that kind of, of um, in this sort of circumstances well of course you know QAnon and uh and, and conspiracy am i am i muted now no oh no you <laughs> sorry <laughs> QAnon, QAnon and the alt-right and all these other like hive mind incredibly energized online subcultures believe they are uniting people and believe they are building a better world and let's not forget that um Mm. tremendously worrying to me is the way in which I think us on the left at the moment are kind of writing off conspiracy theorists as being crackpots and just and simply crazy um, whereas in fact it's probably one of the most important kind of socio-cultural challenges that we've ever faced um, the people have kind of tried to understand the epidemic in the WHO terms is, you know, simply of information. So, so, you know, we, we've all, we've all seen the kind of viral Facebook message or the, you know, the YouTube, you know, talking about the pandemic that's notched up however many billion views, right? What we're not understanding is the social organization, which has happened underneath all of that. This is an entirely parallel world. It's a world that has its heroes, its villains, its languages, its um, its gift shops. You know, you want to you, you buy pandemic T-shirts, you know, you, 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 you buy the hats and and suddenly all of it rolls into the streets. And we realize that QAnon is actually a thing and there's millions of them, you know, and they, 
part of them genuinely believe that they are trying to save us and therefore global politics from satan worshipping democrat pedophiles that is that is the belief right um why that is happening you know is is i think like something we really really have to grasp with which is that when you create this kind of like parallel organization you know that creates has its own news its own newspapers its own spokespeople uh, create just um you know senses of self-esteem and belonging and identity those are really important you're also creating in some cases i think like entirely parallel ways of learning about the world like what researchers like me would call a kind of social epistemology like ways of verifying truth claims um and you know i mean conspiracy theories was the first pamphlet i ever wrote about at devos in 2010. you know we were arguing with the 9 11 truth movement back then that looked like a kind of defanged and and warm and fuzzy version of the kind of conspiracy theorists that are currently burning down 5g towers but it's the same case in all of them they've developed a different a different way of actually arriving at truths like, you know, they look at numerology, they look at kind of hidden links, they look at hanging questions, you know, it's, it's very different from the scientific method, it's very different from, like, basic enlightenment, like, principles to do with, like, what's true and what isn't true. Um, so that, I, I think that's underlying an enormous amount of this. And, um, you know, for sure, the platforms and platform architecture are part of this, um, for sure, like, you know, decision in around 2015 to with a gangnam style problem which i could talk about if you want gave ridiculous amounts of airtime and visibility to fascists and 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 white supremacists in the alt right and and you know or far too late and began to demonetize these people years after through the fact that they had this unbelievably divisive um horrendous content floated to the top and got millions and millions of eyeballs but anyway that's a slightly separate story um uh, the point is that um, now we've kind of seen this kind of fissuring, like really profound levels of fissuring in terms of our social organisation. Uh, and it means that we're at the point where we can't really understand why these very large groups of other people believe the things that they do. Um, and, and the wrong decision for us to make at this point is to write them off as crackpots. Because we wrote the alt-right off as crackpots in 2016 and we lost. And we wrote, you know, plenty of other people off of crackpots over Brexit. And if you're on the wrong side like me, you lost that one as well. Um, and th these groups are going to get bigger. They're becoming more powerful. Like they certainly work with the way that the internet works, with the way that Har Harriet was talking about the way that information surfaces. Um, and currently, a lot of the kind of way in which we're defending and talking about our ideals and our values are not working in that way. And that, and that means that we, we, we are strategically losing a kind of a completely new kind of playing field, a completely new kind of competition over um, ideas and true minds and, and ultimately votes. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Harriet, I wanted to ask you so a couple of a couple of things. Firstly, I, I'd like to hear um, a bit about your um, a bit about the to, to go in slightly more in the sort of pessimistic direction about your work on AI powered advertising and the kind of future of where things are going with this um but also um firstly I, I think you know building on what Carl said there um something that I've as a, a been apparent to me at least is that there seems to be um within the kind of left agenda at the moment there's a there might be a lot of criticism of social media companies and you'll see people kind of like saying they're deleting their Facebook accounts and kind of complaining about what's happening on social media but there doesn't there never seems to have been much of an agenda of putting at the top of their kind of priorities on the left of what do we do instead you know like what is, what is our alternative here even in terms of fixing some of these problems it seems to have you know it was never near the top of the agenda in 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 um that I remember in the in the, the kind of Labour uh, manifesto the last election and you know people there hasn't seemed to be a kind of agreement about that being a priority in, in many other um, manifestos either so I wonder why you think that is and, and, and what could be done to kind of make that something that, that, that needs to be focused on. Yeah I mean gosh we have to, play, have to start playing the game I just want to just like plus 100 everything that Carl just said um, you know so to start off with, my work on AI and advertising has been looking at how, uh, you know, kind of how we link those two conversations together, because 
if you look at um uh, uh, Ian in the comments very very um you know you know clearly said you know goes talking about surveillance capitalism and that's something that phrase has, has developed over the last 12 years because we failed to regulate the amount of data that advertisers have been able to get again you know get on us um, and we failed to, to, to effectively um, kind of safeguard our own our human right to privacy. And, you know, we've allowed uh, social media companies really to kind of, you know, collect a lot of data on us and, and to sell it to, to people that we perhaps really don't want it to be sold to. So on, on that side of things, um, you know, 100, 100, like when we look at, when we look at AI and we look at how we're going to implement it, I think we do we do really well to learn from that conversation and to learn from the impacts of, of, of that lag and to look at the externalities and the issues that they mean the failures is that, that that's caused. The fact that we've created a funding model for the far right, the fact that we've um, you know we've basically um, you know we we were kind of allowing uh, you know kind of organisations to 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 sell you know, kind of our information and targeted in that way in a political, for, in political senses. I mean, that's just, you know, it, it just gets, it's it's scary. We're, we're living through the consequences. We know that this is, this is bad. Um, so for, for, for context, that's, that's what I've been looking at. Um, and I think um, as on the left, we've got to start playing the game. We've got to start playing with the information within the, with, in ways that work within the information environments that we're in. So I think that means creating better messaging. I mean, I think that means creating better content. Someone here has called out the left's misuse of Twitter as an educational platform. 100%, like we're not going to win this with facts. We've got people on the street who think that, you know, kind of who are saying that we shouldn't be wearing masks, think that Bill Gates is chipping our brains. You know, like we can't fight this stuff with facts. And these people are genuinely concerned about their health, about their welfare, about that of their children. These are genuine human emotions, genuine human concerns. It's not just crackpots. If you look at the 5G conspiracy theories and you look at how people get drawn into them, it's genuinely, I think, often because people have Googled it to see if it's a problem because they're concerned about their health or the health of their family. And then you kind of like get drawn into this this, this pit. Like I think Mozilla did a study and found that YouTube could could radicalize people quite effectively over a period of time because of the recommendation algorithm. Because you start out asking a question, and you kind of get can get further and further and further down this rabbit hole. So, we on the left, we've got to start doing it. We've got to start creating better content that works on these platforms. We've got to stop educating and start appealing to emotion. I think very very strongly. We've got to um, you know I think we've we've got to also use our collective power to um you know to challenge people on platforms when we look at how you know people left-leaning cohorts versus right-leaning cohorts behave on social media platforms actually um you know like actually behave what we see is when we look at things like the anti-science um anti-multilateralism and kind of conspiracy theories is that we over here as the left are talking to ourselves and saying, you know, oh gosh, this isn't, you know, this isn't a problem. We should be acting on climate change, whatever, you know, kind of whatever this is. And people over here are all talking to each other and challenging each other and interacting. And so we've got these kind of echo chambers going on. So I would love to see us getting stuck in, trying to kind of challenge some of these stuff, this stuff. And even if the person we're challenging is coming back and saying, you're wrong, Someone else reading it who doesn't feel the same way, or who might be engaged on this journey of trying to find out, find their own truth within this. Because I say their own truth because we know that, that uh, you know truth, truth is definitely subjective in these in these situations. You might find that someone else there reads that forum post, reads your tweet, whatever, and is influenced in that way. So, you know, there's so many. Sorry, that's that was a real a soap, soapbox moment, but it's all about like you know, kind of like playing the game engaging not thinking that we can win through facts and you know kind of appealing to human emotion and I think if we start doing that more we can be more successful um and goodness knows I want us to be more successful I want us to win this because at the moment we're not doing a great job I think in, in a lot of cases and I want you know I, I don't want people to be taken to the streets um 
because they think that um, you know there's 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 all these conspiracies happening. I want us to have the brain space to take action on the things that are really important to us. You know, kind of, uh, I want us to be able to solve inequality. You know, kind of work towards solving inequality. I want us to be talking about racial justice and climate justice, not the way that the right, you know, the the way that the right is setting the agenda at the moment. And I think a lot of that becomes, um, you know, comes more about working out how we can work within the information environments that are, in, it, you know. Um, available to us and also use our might to influence and say and call out and say no Facebook this is wrong how can we mobilize and sort this out so I, I think you know just following on from that and I'm, we'll open up to, to questions quite soon I think because I'd like to hear um, what questions people have in both but I suppose what feels like a bit of a dilemma to me um, you know and I understand absolutely what you're saying Harriet about about kind of going and playing the game better than we are at the moment. But, you know, thinking about the last, the, the 2019 election, I think it felt, the left felt like they had played the game quite well in a sense, you know, like at least they'd appealed very strongly to the people who, who they could speak to, who, you know, when they went for their kind of core message. Um, but I wonder whether, you know, is the game not rigged to some extent, you know, is, can, can the game, is playing the game on the platforms with the rules as they currently are, not contributing in some ways to, to the problem, you know, in in a in the sense that those those platforms are set up in a way that that encourages sort of divisiveness and and kind of splitting off and just and to some extent even behaviorally in terms of distraction and kind of you know you talk about brain space, which I think is really interesting because I think this is we should think about this on a personal level definitely as well as this sort of political level and and. You know how hard I find it. You know, you go on Twitter, and before you know it, six things have annoyed you and sent you off in different directions. But you know, you're not in a space where you can think about a subject or have a subject in deep discussion. You are, you know, overwhelmed with with information, and it does make me wonder whether it's possible to, you know, play that game really well. But then again, if not, where do we? What do we? Where do we go? What do we do? You know, what are the, what are the next steps? You know, can can is there is there a space outside of social media? That has, you know, alternative social media's scale seems to be such an important part of how social media works that it seems sort of fairly fanciful to believe in a, in a kind of alternative social media that could genuinely challenge some of these existing platforms. But Carl, I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about solutions. I know you've written about some of the, the things that have been going on in other areas of the world, which have been, you know, showing how things can work a bit differently. No, for sure. Yeah. And I, I don't think it's fanciful whatsoever. I, I think it's probably what we should actually do. Um, for sure, the, my favourite example of where technology is currently benefiting democracy um, takes us all the way over to Taiwan. I did a kind of documentary for the BBC on them um, late last um, they'd gone through a similar kind of uh, pain and 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 uh, kind of rigor as us. You know, they were a divided society. They were angry with themselves. They were under great pressure externally. Um, they, in fact, were so angry with their parliament that they uh, raided it, kicked the doors down, and occupied it for three weeks. Uh, and this is in 2014. And off the back of it, it's called the Sunflower Revolution. Um, and off the back of that, um, the government did something extraordinary. Something that I every day hope never seen the UK government do. So they, they turned up at a hackathon ran by Taiwan civic hackers and asked them for help. They said, please help us make democracy better. Please help us listen better as a government. We never want anything like this happening again. Um, and the civic hackers produced a really quite magical and important, which we have to pay a lot more attention to here. It's called V Taiwan. Um, a mixed reality scaled listening exercise. Uh, it had, it looks nothing like Twitter, nothing like Facebook, um, but um, does leverage technology to do the opposite of everything that we've been struggling with here. It tries to create consensus rather than earthing decision exactly by changing the very plumbing. So um, government kind of releases V Taiwan when they have a new question that they, they, want, uh, they want an answer to. Um, it brings everyone into this online space, um, the space um, and exactly like Twitter or Facebook, you can kind of draft your own statements and you can respond to the statements of others. You can't reply, you can't troll, but probably the key kind of architectural distinction 
is rather than um, uh, rather than um, surfacing comments which get the most division, they surface comments which get the most consensus. So as you start responding to all this stuff, it starts like mapping out kind of attitudinally, it starts mapping out the, the kind of whole debate. So the first time I did this was on Uber, you had the kind of pro Uber people there, the anti Uber people there. Um, and as people started drafting statements, it started to only your own group agree with, but at least half of the other group started to agree with as well. And that basically gamified consensus finding. Um, and what, what they found was that um, when you even a reasonably, you know, I mean, it sounds like a small tweak, but it's absolutely game changing. Suddenly, um, you know, rather than dwell on the kind of five or six kind of issues of thorny and bitter contention that, that we typically can never get past on any topic of importance to us, it kind of unearths um, 20 or 30 things, actually, that most people held in common with each other. Um, and um, as it earthed these things, it then begins a process where you try and build law or regulation, which basically expresses those kind of common consensual pr principles. I mean, hyper consensus, um, you know, it, it, statements which gain 95, 99 percent consensus amongst the whole group. Um, and the, the most precious thing about this and, 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 you know, there's been lots of kind of activism on the margins across Europe around digital democracy. But the most precious thing about this process is they then connected it to power. They actually connected it to kind of legal outcome. So you're not just chatting, you're not just kind of, you know, galvanizing the base. Um, as these consensus statements emerged, they then turned them into law. And they did it again and again and again and again. They've done it for about 25 different pieces of laws and regulations now, everything from kind of online sale of alcohol through to lots of technology questions, um, through to whether to change Taiwan's time zone or not. Um, you know, so that's where I think we should be we be going now. I mean, if you outside of Facebook, I, I don't think digital democracy look is anything like Facebook or Twitter at all. Uh, but outside of those platforms, really, if you think about it, what democracy even could be nowadays has completely exploded. It could be almost anything we imagine it to be. We don't have to be locked into ideas of, you know, uh, parliaments or majoritarian voting or, um, you know, representative democracy really even at all. Um, and, and definitely, if we want to use online platforms as part of that way of kind of gathering views and understanding them, then then, then Polis and what the Taiwan have done is, is a really good lesson for us. Um, what's most painful about it, of course, is that not only have they had common problems to us and found a way through it, but they also have pretty much a kind of ready-made process and are willing to go around the world teaching people how to do this. It's not even a, uh, it's not even in a kind of, you know, an unfamiliar or untried or tested process. It's a, it's a matter of day-to-day -day political life in Taiwan now. Um, I just really wish that, um, I just really wish that, that we can, maybe at a local level across the UK next, begin to start kind of experimenting with this more and more and, and kind of turning it into reality. Yeah, absolutely. Harry, did you, so did you want to say something? I think it was your hand. No, 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 sorry, that was just me. Uh... I was for, uh, <laughs> looking at the documentary online, I, apart from saying that sounds fantastic, can we please have it yeah. now? <laughs> No, I do. I mean, I think it's worth... Um, Just to drop sorry, in, to say we've got 10 minutes until the end of the session. Absolutely. Well, we'll open up to questions, shall we? I can, I'll just quickly, I'll recommend as well, um, Audrey Tang, who's been, I think, quite important in the, the Taiwanese um, model, um, did a really good session at um, RightsCon this year that I think worth looking up. I found that a really useful summary of sort of the principles and how it's worked in practice and everything. So I would I recommend Googling that. I'll stick it in the chat. But... Um, any, so we'll open up to questions. I'm not exactly sure how this works, if I'm being honest, whether there's, if they're just questions go in the chat or whether... Um, yeah, questions in the chat box. If you've put a question in the chat box maybe five, ten minutes ago, if you could just copy and paste that to bring that to the top. And then, Dan, if you want to scroll down the chat box as well so you can see the latest entries. Yeah. Well, I'll just like to see if people want to kind of re-up their questions. Oh, here we go. Here's one. So, Oliver, what is the impact on social media on discussions, debates within the left? Pros and cons. I have an opinion about this, but any <laughs> either of you want to uh, respond to that? Go on, Daniel. Yeah, well, I think. I mean, I think that there's something very interesting about um, how, as I said at the beginning, the it, 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 there seems to be an incentive towards. Um, 
not only kind of outrage, we talk a lot about sort of outrage and emotional content, and, and that's obviously part of it. But I think what there also seems to be a sort of identity signaling form of kind of um, of communication that seems to be heavily incentivized by social media. And so we've got this now. And this is common, I think, if you look across um, the right as well, of course, you know, across the political spectrum is is you have sort of political entrepreneurs, opportunists who think, OK, I can I can. Um, if I communicate about this issue in this particular way, I can. This is how I sort of game the system and get the most. And that tends to be uh, a lot about, you know, selectively taking the worst examples out of context of your opponents and saying, look how terrible these people are. Um, and then, you know, reacting very quickly to current events with controver intentionally controversial takes that then get themselves, you know, and that the effect of that on 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 sort of discourse within the left, I think generally, I think is, is incredibly damaging. And, and it's one of the reasons I think I had an argument with someone um, on Twitter, ironically, about how Twitter, um, I thought Twitter was not as damaging as Facebook, but was very damaging actually as a platform because despite its much lower reach, the influence that it had on the way that we were discussing topics, you know, you see stories on the BBC News, which say sort of like Twitter outrage at, and it turns out not almost nobody is outraged about it, but then people respond to the story about the outrage. And, you know, and it's that kind of uh, reflexive nature of kind of um, how the social media platforms have worked and how they've kind of that logic has infected um, journalism more widely that I think is, is also really, really negative and then does make, you know, the, the idea of building a kind of consensus, a broad consensus um, towards sort of say democ democratic reform and so on being less likely. So I think that's one of the bigger things to overcome. Um, Johnny is asking a question, Harriet. What other emotions are there on social media apart from you, outrage? You, you can ignore that one. Um, yeah, ignore that one. I think there's a there's a much more important question here from Will, which is just copied back in. Um, yes. Which is basically saying, how do we yeah, not kind of follow the, the model of emotional blackmail and manipulation? So what does the appeal to emotion look like from a left perspective? Can I, can I, I have a, I have, I'm going to be quite controversial on this. How would we get out of the cycle of emotional appeal as a form of manipulation? I don't think we do. I genuinely don't think we do because I think people have been framing things to appeal to human emotion for since, hum, since we invented language. Um, it's the reason that, that fantastic candidates appeal to us. It's the reason that, um, yeah, fine, it's the reason that marketing and advertising works. I don't think that we, I think we must get away from this idea that if we speak the truth well enough, we will win. And I think we must get away from the idea that there is a truth, a universal truth for everybody. We've got to be, to, to, to make people puke in their mouths a little bit, but we've got the best product, right? We have got a world where we, you know, where people are looked after, where there is equality, where you know where the interests of the many um you know kind of are overweigh the interests of a few people with a lot of money we've got when you look at the british public when you survey them they're consistently more left-wing than the policies that they vote for the part the policies of the parties that they vote for we have got the best product we have got this what we need to we, what we must do is is package that up in a way that acknowledges that human beings are complex creatures who, who, who have fears and worries and concerns that don't always fit with ours. So what is the thing, what is the thing that, um, you know, kind of makes people, um, you know, kind of that the, the, the other side play on to sell this anti-immigration narrative to, you know, to talk about the things that divide us? Well, often it's, I'm, I'm really worried about the future of my kids, actually, or I'm really worried about my ability to pay my bills. And what the other side does is they say, it's their fault. It's single mums, it's migrants, it's whatever. They create an enemy and they use those narratives to manipulate us and tell us that, you know, that actually what we know was caused by austerity was actually caused by this bloke over here who's come from Romania. So we've got to get better at telling that story and um we you know that will involve emotional manipulation in but for me that we've got to do it to win because i would much rather 
be talking to you guys about the finer points of Keir Starmer's policies in power than I would do having Boris Johnson for another four years and, and arguing about whether someone else was a better was a better kind of candidate. And I feel really strongly about that. So sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> no, thank you, Harry. And um, I, I knew this would happen, but I'm looking at and thinking, looking at the questions coming through and thinking we could do another hour here quite easily without having got to this point. Um, so I even start to try and answer some of these questions. Um, so Carl, I think if I come to you and just you know, you're, you're seeing the last few questions. I don't know if you want to take one of those or like one of those areas and just have uh, or add some general thoughts now coming towards the end of the session, particularly, I guess, around, you know, we, we talked about um, the Taiwan and some of the models that we might want to work to and there's some other good examples and some of your writing. But, you know, in practice, that took a particular moment in, in, in Taiwan and, and obviously the connection up with a kind of government governing power that was willing to kind of do that when we're, we're far from having a governing power that seems likely to want that sort of setup to be um, popularized here um, what are the steps that we can take um, towards a better social media improving what we have building something different you know as well as as Harriet says being more effective on on the platforms that exist yeah well I mean governing governing power can look can look very different. So it might be obviously a national parliament, but it might be a local, um, you know, planning permission. It might be to do with like a, a park upgrade. Um, it could be all manner of different things. It, it might not even necessarily be a kind of formal political unit. It might be kind of much more voluntary kinds of organizations, very large charities, membership organizations who want to understand and express their, you know, their memberships and the kind of decisions they make. The National Trust, NSPCC, who knows? Um, Western here is said, is, is the time right for a mass migration? Um, I, 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 yes, uh, in terms of um, we, we have to rethink how democracy works as the people that are part of it have completely changed their ideas about what they want out of a democracy, how responsive they think it must be. As you say, Daniel, a whole nother hour can be put on the kind of changing expectations that people have and how the kind of formal process of, of parliamentary democracy isn't quite filling them at the moment. Um, but but for anyone listening to this, I mean, like I, I think like it, it's not going to be just millions of people some polis or whatever the platforms are spoken about. Well, we'll, we'll make this connecting that kind of process up with meaningful decisions and meaningful outcomes wherever they exist um, and whatever they look like. That will be how this begins to change in the UK. Um, I, I don't think that we will see the mother of all parliaments begin to dissolve. I mean, our democracy is so old, it's essentially ossified, but we can definitely start creating examples and opportunities around that, local, voluntary, cooperative, um, whatever. Um, and, and there might be people here that, that actually have the power to kind of connect or, or create a kind of opportunity like that. And, and I think that they should begin to do it. I mean, there are people out there, including Demos, um, who will help. You know, they will they will help construct the kind of what this process might look like and and the platforms that it might involve. Send me an email. Um, but but let, let's not wait for millions of people to suddenly start to join a platform because it won't happen unless we connect it up with a meaningful outcome. Um, and let's not wait for our parliament to do it because that simply won't happen. And we'll we'll spend the next three decades having this debate. Um, without celebrating all the things that um, the internet can actually do for democracy as well. Okay, Carl, I mean, no, we, yeah, we like Dan said, we could definitely do with another hour here, um, but I'm going to have to unfortunately call, uh, draw this session to a close. Um, thank you so much to the panellists, to Harriet, Carl, and thank you to Dan for chairing the session, and thanks for the um, the comments in the chat. Um, if you want to see Dan again this evening, we've got an amazing session on ownership in crisis um, from seven o'clock. It's going to be the well, final. There are other reasons to see that session. Just there, there are, there are. But if you want to see more of Dan, um, that's part of the part of the package too. Um, but yeah, we've got Jessica Gordon Nemhard, um, who's a professor at John Jay College um, and an activist in the state, and we've got Yancy Strickler, who is the founder of Kickstarter um, and who's been writing more about democratic ownership and the ownership crisis, um, which is part of the inspiration for our, um, our session tonight. 
So thanks again to everybody. Um, if you want to come back and see us at seven, if you go to the reception now, you can also see the schedule for the next few days. Um, so kind of dip in and dip out, hopefully see you again. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.